Okay, so I encourage you to come down here because I'm going to do everything on the board. I don't know if you'll be able to see, but I'll try and write big. Um, it, it's, if I'm teaching, I figure I should write on the board because if you don't write on the board, you go too fast. So um, I'm going to also assume that you, um, I'm not going to assume that you know much <laughs> about what I'm going to talk about, but um, I'm going to start a little bit just to introduce you to neuroscience or the brain, all right? Everybody know where that is, right? All right, that's, you know, cut the skull, lift it up, there's the brain, all right? And the part and inside the brain are millions and millions of neurons, all right? And typically, neurons come in many shapes and many varieties, uh, but if you're crude about it, you can break it into two kinds, excitatory and inhibitory. Excitatory guys make other guys want to fire, and inhibitory guys suppress that fire. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. All right, so what does a neuron look like? Typically, a neuron looks like this. I'm going to draw a particular kind of neuron that is very common. This is called a, oh, there. That's called a pyramidal cell. And it consists of several parts. This is the soma. Okay, this is the, these guys, this is, these guys are called basal dendrites. Right here, and this is the apical dendrite. And this is the axon. And the way you can think about this is information flows in this direction. from the dendrites into the soma and then out the axon, okay? And what happens is when the voltage of this neuron, if you stick an electrode in here, it's typically minus 60 millivolts, okay? It's typically the, what's, this is called the reversal potential or resting potential. of the neuron, and what happens is if you inject the current into here, you can raise the voltage up, okay, and that's called depolarize. Depolarize moves voltage to zero, okay? And you can hyperpolarize. moves voltage down, more negative, all right? And so excitatory neurons depolarize other neurons, and I'll explain how that all works in just a second, and inhibitory neurons hyperpolarize, okay? So how do they talk to each other? Well, what you have to do is open up the neuron, and you realize that the neuron is just like any other cell. It has a cell membrane, okay? The cell membrane consists of um, eraser. Ah. Can everybody see? Am I writing big enough? All right, good, good. All right, so the cell membrane think of the cell membrane as consisting of a bunch of fatty tissue, lipids, okay? And anybody who's ever, you know, gone to a French restaurant and gotten brain to eat realizes it's very high in cholesterol because of all this fatty tissue or the fatty stuff in the cells, okay? So brain's not good for you to eat, um, okay? And you get, so this is inside, this is outside, and this is inside inside the cell. So you can think of the cell as having an outside and an inside. 
There's this two-dimensional surface around it, which is the cellular membrane, okay? That's the really thing that constitutes biology, is everything in biology has an, everything that constitutes something that's alive has an inside and an outside, because to do self stuff, you have to concentrate things enough on the inside to make stuff happen, okay? So that's inside is where all the DNA is and everything else. But we're not going to talk about that here, okay? And I've drawn this gap here. People call this a lipid bilayer. Has anybody here studied any electricity, like capacitors? Like when did, yeah, well in the old days they used to have television sets. I don't even know if they have television sets anymore. You guys do everything on your phone. But they used to have these big television sets and they had a big whopping capacitor in there, okay? And a capacitor is basically two conducting things separated by something that doesn't conduct. We used to play, you charge that conductor up and then you could shock your friends because it's like 120 volts or something like that. Knock them across the room. Um, that's what taser is also. But this forms a capacitor. So there's capacitance across here, and that means that you can load up charge. All right? That's the key thing here. And then what allows things to go inside and out are channels. All right? That's what this is. They're, they're pro complicated proteins. And outside the cell, the main ions generate this difference in potential here are sodium, there's a lot of sodium outside the cell, chloride, and there's very little potassium outside the cell, all right? Inside the cell, there's just a little bit of sodium, there is a lot, there's just, there's, there's some chloride, and there's a lot of potassium, okay? So normally, if you have a bucket and you've got a lot of stuff here and a little bit of stuff here, then a lot of stuff wants to flow, okay? So if this neuron would, if this membrane would let anything out, then the potassium would want to go out, all right? Potassium has a positive charge. So if the potassium leaves the cell, it's going to make the cell more negative, okay? So potassium channels, these channels are special. They open those and they only let very certain ions through, okay? So potassium channels only let potassium ions through. Sodium channels only let sodium ions through. So what happens if a sodium channel opens is sodium starts to go inside, okay? And that makes the neuron more positive, okay? So that depolarizes. So sodium channels depolarize the neuron. Potassium channels hyperpolarize them. Chloride channels turn out to just kind of maintain things at rest, okay? Prade cares a lot about chloride channels. I don't, okay? Because he studies a different organ than I do. Um, hold on. There we go. Okay, so we're going to get to some math in just a second. I just wanted to introduce to. So, okay, how does a neuron communicate with other neurons? Well, if you think of this as just a passive cable, does anybody here, do people use cables anymore for speakers or anything like that? Probably not, <laughs> okay? Well, cables have resistance in them, and the longer the cable, the more resistance and the more surface area of the cable that things can leak out, the, the more things decay. So if you want to communicate from your foot to your, to your brain or to your spinal cord, okay, Passively, electricity is not, is going to be, by the time it gets up that far, there's going to be nothing there, okay? So what you need is an active process so that when this guy reaches a certain potential, okay, it causes something called an action potential to move through here and propagates along here. And so what happens is this action potential propagates along here. 
propagates here, and then what happens is it reaches these terminals, all right? So here's the action potential. This is on the axon. It reaches these terminals, okay? And these terminals contain calcium, all right? Calcium is the most important molecule in biology. Everything in biology is controlled by calcium, and calcium is also very, very highly controlled by the cell. There's all kinds of stuff. We aren't going to talk about that at all. So what happens, I mean, we'll talk about calcium channels a little bit, but um, for now, I'm not going to worry about that. What happens is this action potential comes through here. It invades this thing called a synaptic bouton. Okay? So the action potential comes in here. It depolarizes this bouton because it's Sodium is coming in all the way through here, okay? That opens up calcium channels, which cause all kinds of machinery in here to release something called neurotransmitter. Okay? And neurotransmitters, I'll talk about those in a little bit, they come in different forms, okay? The main types of neurotransmitters What the neurotransmitters do is they get into the extracellular space and they activate channels on the dendrites, okay? And those channels open up and they allow ions in, okay? So that's how this whole thing is, how, how the whole cycle is closed, okay? So you inject current in here, it makes an action potential, the action potential flows down the axon, invades the synaptic bouton, releases neurotransmitter, which spews onto some other neuron, okay? And that could either inhibit it or excite it, depending on the type of neurotransmitter it is. And that will either depolarize this other neuron or it will hyperpolarize it. So the two main kinds of neurotransmitter are I won't write out the full name, I'll just call it AMPA, and that's excitatory. And GABA, inhibitory. Okay, so AMPA depolarizes the neuron, and GABA hyperpolarizes it. So the guy that is sending the signal is called presynaptic. And the guy receiving the signal up here is called postsynaptic, right? Pre, post, okay? So basically, AMPA will excite other neurons and GABA will inhibit other neurons. Now there's a principle called Dale's principle Dale's principle says that if a neuron is excitatory on one guy, he's excitatory on everybody, okay? So this guy could only excite, and he excites. There might be another guy who only inhibits, but nobody excites and inhibits, okay? Just want to understand that. that The presynaptic neuron is either excitatory or inhibitory, but not both, but never both. Okay, so there is all I'm going to tell you about neurons, right? Because we got to get to some math, right, and physics. Equations, right? You guys like equations? Right, good, good. I like equations too. Um, but I'm a faker, okay? Not like the Indian type of fake. I'm a phony because uh, I'm not a mathematician. My PhD's in biophysics. Okay? But I 
learned how to prove theorems, so I guess I'm sort of now a mathematician. Okay, so um, let's let's go inside this thing and let's write an electrical circuit. You guys have have some of you had electrical circuit theory? Yes? No? Okay, well I'll draw a little electrical circuit and you can tell me if you've ever seen anything like this. Okay, so this is a typical membrane, a model for a membrane. Okay, so I will write here, out, in. And this is a capacitor, C, also called CM for the membrane capacitor. And I've written three resistors here, okay? So in, in neuroscience, people do talk about resistance, but they generally think of things in the reciprocal resistance, which is called conductance, all right? So if conductance is big, that means resistance is low and current passes through. So I'm going to, I've drawn three resistor or conductances here. I'm going to write GL, GK, and GNA. Okay, that corresponds to something called leak, which is a mixture of chloride and things. It's just a background conductance that gives the, mem the neuron its membrane potential. This is the sodium, I mean the potassium conductance. If this conductance goes up, then potassium can get through, okay? And this is called the sodium conductance. And these guys, E is called the reversal potential. Of the particular thing, it's a battery, all right? So that if GK is big and GNA and GL are very small, then everything will be determined by this battery, EK, all right? And this reversal potential is proportional to the log of the ratio of the concentrations in and out, okay? If you want to know the exact formula, let's see, I think E is equal to minus, um, let's see, is it um, Z, F, R, T, natural log of There we go. Okay? She said, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay? So that's the Nertz formula. All right? So for sodium, okay, in is very small compared to out. So in over out is considerably less than one. And log of that is there for negative, and this is the temperature, this is the ideal constant, as Faraday's constant, 96,000 coulombs per mole, roughly, I forget, this is eight point something, and T is absolute temperature, all right? So ENA is typically 55 millivolts, okay? EK, is typically minus 80 millivolts, and E leak is typically minus 60 millivolts. E leak is just a kind of mixture of different things, okay? So that's what these batteries represent. Everybody call that? So this is typically, this is what the membrane looks like, and so what happens is if 
you could somehow suddenly make GNA big, all right, what would happen? Suppose at rest, when the neuron's not doing anything, GL is big, GK and GNA are close to zero, okay? I mean, it's not big, but these guys are close to zero, okay? So the neuron is sitting at minus 60 millivolts. So now an experimentalist comes along and he injects a current into here. Okay, sticks an electrode into the cell and puts a current step in there. So what does it do? It raises the potential of the membrane. Okay, because you're injecting current into it. Raises the potential. Turns out that these channels here are voltage sensitive. They're called voltage gated ion channels. They're dependent on voltage. I'm gonna write down some equations for them in a second. But the idea here is that the sodium channel reacts faster than the potassium channel. So that starts to open. So what happens when that opens is it allows sodium to come in, okay? And when sodium comes in, that makes the potential go up even more, right? As the potential goes up more, more sodium comes in, and you get this explosive process, okay? So you get this positive feedback. More sodium comes in, and it sends the voltage up close to 55 millivolts, okay? The sodium channel is complicated in the, in the so-called Hodgkin-Huxley equations, and I'll get to that in just a second. But at high potentials, um, the sodium channel actually starts to shut down again. But in the meantime, the potassium channel starts to open, okay? Potassium channels are slower. They open, and what does that do? That causes potassium to leave. And if the potassium leaves, then the cell becomes more negative. So what you see when you inject the current in the cell, there's the current I'm injecting. Here's the voltage. You see the volt, there's the hump where the current came on. There's where the sodium kicks in. Now the sodium panels close because of this complicated process, which I'll get to in just a second. All right, so then it's going to go back to rest, but by now the potassium channels have come in. That makes the neuron more negative, okay? And then once that happens, these channels close up and everything goes back to rest. So this is the action potential, all right? What that does is it propagates down this axon, opening, other opening those synaptic gates and allowing things to go. That, that, that's the way you communi neurons communicate. They communicate with these action potentials. Now, there's, others, there's lots of machinery in your cell to this, make this happen. What happened? When we had that action potential, potassium left the cell, so to the cell, right? And if that keeps happening, then after a while there won't be any potassium left in the cell. Cell's pretty small compared to the extracellular space, and it'll be filled with potassium and won't have any, um, it'll be filled with sodium, won't have any potassium, and it'll just sit there, it's dead, right? It's no good anymore. So, and this all looked like it was happening for free. Nothing is for free, all right? So what happens is there's a pump, and this pump is a very important pump. It's the sodium-potassium exchange pump, and what that pump does is it pumps sodium back out and pumps potassium back in, and it costs money. It costs ATP, okay? If you don't know what ATP is, that's the currency of biology, adenosine triphosphate, okay? And everything that you need for energy and everything else is ATP, okay? So that's the currency. It's, it's worth a lot. I don't know how much it is in rupees or dollars. It's the currency of, of biology, and that's why it costs your brain, believe it or not, is using a huge amount of your resting metabolism just to keep your brain going, all right? 
because it's always going and it's using a lot, because of this pump, it's using a lot of energy, okay? So, there is your neurobiology introduction, everything you need to know biology. So I'm gonna now start to write down some equations. Don't worry, I'll use the nice colored chalk in a little bit. All right, so let's write down the balance equation for this electrical circuit, okay? C dV dt plus GL V minus EL plus GK V minus EK plus GNA V minus ENA equals I. Okay, I is the input current. So this is the current inside the cell. Capacitance times the derivative of voltage is a current. Conductance, have, has anybody here ever heard the phrase V equals IR? Okay. V equals IR. Voltage equals current times resistance. So I equals V over R equals GV. Remember, 1 over R is conductance. A little bit about units. Now, I teach a lot of math students. Math students hate units. Physics students know what units are, okay? But math students hate them. So I'm going to give you all the units here, all right? Typically used, okay? V is in typically in millivolts, okay? Thousandth of a volt. C is typically microfarads per centimeter squared, okay? Remember, the membrane is a two-dimensional sheet, all right? So this is, and it turns out that Whoever designed the brain was really nice to mathematicians because the capacitance is pretty much constant across all neural tissue at one microfarad per centimeter squared. So we usually ignore it because it's one, <laughs> okay? So one times anything, is, since you guys are math guys, you know that one, time, one is the identity element in the multiplicative group. Okay, so that's typically microfarads per centimeter squared. Conductance is typically in millisiemen per centimeter squared, okay? Siemen is one over an ohm, okay? You guys know what ohms? You've heard of ohms, right? Uh, you're Indian, right? Isn't that meditation, right? Ohm, okay? Well, in neuroscience, uh, well, never mind. I won't make any jokes about this word. Okay, so millisiemens per centimeter squared, all right? And current has to be what? Well, let's look, all right? Oh, and time is milliseconds, okay? So, let's see. If this is millisecs per centimeter squared, and this is millivolts, then millisiemens times millivolts is microamps, okay? So I is microamps per centimeter squared. It's a current flux, all right? So there is the way to think about this. So whenever you see a model, you have to keep in mind what those units mean because people will sometimes use different units. Okay, so if you're gonna do a simulation, you have to keep all of them straight, okay? So, we have this picture. And what Hodgkin and Huxley, Hodgkin and Huxley, building on some other people earlier on in 1950s, I think it was 1955 or so, 1952, 
1952. 1952, they wrote a series of seminal papers that explain the action potential of the squid. All right. Squid is a, uh, squids are really cool. I'm working with a couple, with a couple of people on squid. You guys know what a squid is? Okay, so squids are cephalopods. Okay, they're the, they're the brainiacs of the invertebrates. They're the smartest invertebrates. Okay, and they have on their skin this really cool ability to open and close these little, um, little things called chromatophores. Okay, and so they generate all kinds of patterns that can blend in camouflage almost instantly, and they the squid, two squids can be talking to each other in a private, uh, a private conversation. The outside of the squid, it's all white, but in the inside, they're flashing all their gang signs and stuff, okay? So they're, they're, they're really cool, these cephalopods, but they were, they were not using it for their skin. They were using it for their axon, because squid has a giant axon, okay? And they were able to dissect out how the action potential worked. They lucked out because the squid action potential is pretty simple. And what happens is that these channels, I'll write like this, GK, they deduced that GK was something like GK bar, a constant, times N to the fourth, okay? And N obeyed some very simple equations, dN dt equals alpha N of V, one minus N minus beta N of V, N. I won't go through how they d discovered this, but GK looks like this, dN dt looks like that, and if you understand something called a Markov process, the channel can exist in two states, open or closed, okay? So open or closed, let me start with closed here. Closed to open and open back to closed. So closed to open happens at a rate alpha of V and open to closed happens at a rate beta of V, all right? So if you write down the simple mass action for this and you notice that you're either open or closed, then the number of clo the probability of being closed is one minus the probability of being open. So N is the probability of one of these, the, the, the potassium channel consists of four subunits. They're all independent and all four of them have to be open at the same time for it to conduct. So if N is the probability of one guy being open, the probability of being four open is N to the fourth, right? Remember from probability, because they're independent, okay? So the potassium channel satisfies a very simple equation like this. I mean, and GK is this, all right? So now we suddenly have two coupled differential equations. We have a differential equation for voltage. We have a differential equation for um, the potassium channel. What about the sodium channel? Leak is fixed, that's just a constant. And let's do our friend sodium. Sodium's more complicated. Oh, let me, let me write this a slightly different way. Okay, I'm gonna write this like this. N infinity of V minus N over tau n of v, okay? Just rewritten it, okay? Let's see if we can figure out what tau, we, we can see immediately from this that tau n is one over alpha n plus beta n, okay? And n infinity is alpha n over alpha n plus beta n, okay? Because you could write down, what does this equal to zero? When n equals alpha over alpha plus beta, okay? Now, remember, n is dimensionless as probability. T is milliseconds, so this is one over milliseconds. 
So alpha and beta have to have dimensions of one over millisecond. The rates, because this is a rate equation. And so one over those has dimensions of millisecond. So this is a time constant, right? Does that make sense? And n infinity dimensionless. So typically, what does n infinity look like for this? n infinity looks like this, voltage. n infinity goes up from, it goes from zero to one. Kind of looks like this saturating function, and it's an in monotonically increasing function of voltage. So the higher the voltage, the bigger n infinity is. And everybody here should know how to solve this differential equation. I'll write it right down. What's the solution to this equation if V is held fixed? V is held fixed. The solution to this is N of T equals N infinity of V plus N of zero minus N infinity of V. E to the minus T over tau N of V. This is just a linear differential equation. <laughs> and things just jump up. They grow. Um, exponentially until as t goes to infinity, it goes to n infinity of v. That's the steady state of this thing. Okay? So at t equals zero, you can see that's the initial condition. Okay? So now what about the sodium channel? GNA is equal to GNA bar m cubed h. Okay? So it consists of two things. M opens and allows things to go. H at rest, at rest, M is close to zero, and H is close to one. H, so let's write down, these guys have the same equations. dm dt equals alpha M of V, one minus M minus beta M of V, M, and dh dt equals alpha h of v, 1 minus h minus beta h of v, h, same thing as before. And I'll go over here. This is an infinity of v, m infinity of v, and h infinity of v. So h decreases with voltage, whereas m and n increase. So you might ask, how the heck can the sodium channel ever open? Because if the voltage is low, h is close to 1, m is close to 0, so g and n is close to 0. And if the voltage is high, H is close to zero, but M is close to one, and again, it looks like this is zero. So what happens is that M is much faster. Alpha and beta are much bigger for M than they are for H. So what happens is if you sit at rest and you suddenly move the voltage up by injecting current. It takes a while for the H to react, and the M reacts almost instantly. Okay? These are the same things that generate your cardiac action potential. And the M, the M, the time constant of the up jump of your cardiac action potential is in the order of um, about 100, uh, less than 100 microseconds. All right. They really want that thing to work well, right? <laughs> Who cares if your neurons don't fire? <laughs> yeah, so what? You don't need to think, but your heart needs to keep pumping, okay? Um, so that's very robust. All right. 
So, so we can write again, this is m infinity of v minus m over tau m of v, and this is h infinity of v minus h over tau h of v. All right, so there's our four differential equations. This is a four-dimensional dynamical system. A dynamical system is what fancy people call <laughs> sets of differential equations, okay? Um, so there's one, two, three, four ODEs, four differential equations. I don't know if Prona is gonna do, you're gonna do the bifurcation uh, diagram for Hodgkin-Huxley? I'll, I'll give you the code for it, it's pretty easy. Okay, we aren't going to analyze the Hodgkin-Huxley equations because that's too complicated. But I do want to, uh, we're going to analyze a much simpler model. But I want to tell you that in general, let's think about these equations more generally. Okay, so we have C dv dt. sum g bar sub j n sub j to some power p sub j h, oh, h sub j to some power q sub j v minus e sub j. So they can all be written like that. Okay? All these all these Voltage-gated channels could be written like this. So for example, for the potassium channel, Q is zero, because there's no guy here, and P is four. For the sodium, P is three, and Q is one. For the leak, these guys are both zero, okay? So this is a general way to write this, equals I, okay? So one of the first things that people should be interested in. There's several things we should be interested in. Is if I inject current and I keep the constant current there, what happens to that neuron? What's the state of that neuron? Okay? So I'm going to inject current and ask what is the state of that neuron? So if it doesn't do anything except the voltage goes up a little bit and then it stays constant, then it's reached a steady state. So a steady state in, in math, we have something called a steady state or that means it's not changing anymore. Now I want to say, suppose I inject the constant current and the neuron starts to oscillate, okay? That's another kind of steady state, but it's not a constant steady state, okay? It's, it's periodic, or maybe chaotic, or something like that. But we're gonna talk, start to talk first about equilibria, okay? If the steady state is constant, then we say it's reached an equilibrium. Or we call this a fixed point, equilibrium point. Fixed point, singular point. Those are all basically synonyms for the same thing. It means a set of values, in this particular case, for Hodgkin Huxley, V naught, M naught, H naught, N naught, such that dv dt is zero, dn dt is zero, dm dt is zero, dh dt is zero, okay? So that's an equilibrium point. It turns out that finding equilibria points for these things is astonishingly simple because you end up having to only solve one equation and one unknown. Why is that? Well, let's see, if we want an equilibrium, we want the MDT to be zero, so M equals M infinity of V, H equals H infinity of V, N equals N infinity of V, right? 
<laughs> that was easy. You, that, right, you can see that's a real easy equation to solve. When is this zero? <laughs> m equals m infinity of v. And you plug that into here, and now you just have, remember we're at equilibria, so C D V D T zero, so you just have this thing, each, each one of these is a function of voltage, this is a function of voltage, equals I. So let me write it for the Hodgkin-Huxley. For the Hodgkin-Huxley, you have GL V minus EL plus GK bar N to the fourth, N infinity to the fourth of V, V minus EK plus GN A bar M infinity cubed of V, H infinity of V equals I, okay? That would be equilibrium. All I've done is plug M equals M infinity and so on in there. Now, you say, ah, professor, but these are really complicated functions of voltage. How can I solve this equation? Don't solve it. I don't care. <laughs> no, you don't solve it. We'll just call this thing a function of voltage, I steady state of V, okay? And we'll plot this function. That's all we do is plot that, all right? So if we plot I steady state of V for the Hodgkin-Huxley, you'll get something that looks like this. Okay? I steady state of V like this, okay? And we just want to solve, so this is V along here. And so all we have to do to find an equilibrium point is to draw a line at the value of I that you want. <laughs> There's the value of I. And where it intersects, that's the steady state. So instead of solving for voltage, we'll just plot it this way and then find the intersections on the line, all right? So this case has what's called a monotonic steady state IV curve, all right? Goes up like this, monotonically. But in the model we're gonna look at about 10 minutes, the steady state IV curve can look like this. Might look like that. What does that mean? It means that for low ver currents, there's one steady state. For high currents, there's one steady state. But for intermediate currents, there could be up to three steady states. So now we can just reverse this curve and plot the current, the voltage, the voltage steady state as a function of current. Okay, we'll do that in a minute. All right, so that seems to be it. We seem to have solved the problem of completely understanding the action potential, except for one thing, okay? So I'm gonna introduce a new concept, equilibrium points. Let me, let me now step back for, for a second. And um, talk about general things, okay? So this is a general idea of differential equations. And then we're going to apply it to a somewhat simpler system. Okay, so let's suppose we have dx dt equals f of x. Okay, so that's a general differential equation. F takes R n into R n. That's n-dimensional reals. Okay, so this is an n-dimensional differential equation. So what does an equilibrium mean for this or a fixed point? It means dx t is zero. So f of x naught equals zero. Okay? So that's a, and equations and unknowns, that's a hard problem. You guys have probably had to do this. Has anybody here heard of Newton's method? You remember that from calculus? Right, you find you use Newton's method to find equilibrium or to find roots of zero, roots of functions. Okay, you have to have a good guess to start with, but 
it still works. It's a really good way of getting an equilibrium point. So we have an equilibrium point. You guys know what a pendulum is. You've probably seen a pendulum. Huh? And a pendulum has an equal, a pendulum with friction. Okay, so we have a pendulum with friction. It has an equilibrium point, which is down there. It also has an equilibrium point that's up there. If, the, if you were able to balance that pendulum perfectly, that's also an equilibrium point. So now we can ask another question that we ask in mathematics is, or in dynamical systems, is this stable? All right, so what do I mean by stable? It means if I give it a little kick, if I perturb it away from that a little bit, start with an initial condition that's close to that equilibrium point, let, let the differential equation go, will it come back to that equilibrium point? And will it stay near that equilibrium point? Well, this you know is clearly a stable equilibrium point. If I kick the pendulum a little bit, it comes back. This guy is not a stable equilibrium, right? Because if I give this a little kick, right? If it were stable, then neckties would be really cool, <laughs> okay? But it, they aren't. Oh, I like neckties. Apparently, there's a study that shows that neckties retard the flow of blood to the brain, okay? That explains Trump. Oh, this is being taped, isn't it? Sorry. Okay. Okay, so we want to study whether an equilibrium is stable or not. So what are we going to do? We're going to start with an initial condition. X of 0 equals x naught plus y. Okay? Y is small. All right? And then we're going to ask what happens to this differential equation. So if we plug, if we make the change, we, we make the assumption, let's, let's um, oh, I'm sorry, x of t is x naught, oh, x of 0 is, x of 0 is x naught plus y of 0. y of 0 is a small number, okay? And so we'll let x of t be x naught plus y of t. What does y of t satisfy? dy dt equals f x naught plus y of t, right? Nothing magical there, because this is a constant. So if I take the derivative of x naught, I get 0. Now, here we do. We're going to make an approximation. This is approximately, you guys all have had calculus, so you know Taylor's theorem. Okay? This is approximately f of x naught plus derivative of f with respect to x. The root of respect to x evaluated at x naught times y of t plus Taylor's remainder theorem plus remainder stuff that's small or y squared. Okay? Everybody cool with that? This is just zero because we're at an equilibrium point. This is a constant matrix A. Okay? And this is small. So if y is small, y squared is even smaller, right? So this is actually not an approximate. This is equal. But now we're going to make it into an approximate. Get rid of this. Okay? So we've reduced the study of stability to the study of a linear differential equation of the form dy dt equals ay. So now we have to ask, if we start with y arbitrarily, if we start with some value, of, or some initial condition y, what is the fate of y? So if this system is to be stable, we hope that y will decay to 0, right? Because that's the perturbation. Right, because x of t is x naught plus y, so if y decays to zero, we'll go back to x. Okay? So, does everybody know how to solve a linear differential equation? 
The solution to a linear differential equation is typically y of t is, well, you can write it in terms of an exponential. I don't want to get into that. It can be written as sum of c sub k, e sub k, e to the lambda k t. I mean, it can be written, there's more, it's a little more general than that, but it's roughly like this, where c sub k are arbitrary constants, e sub k are eigenvectors, and lambda sub k are eigenvalues of this matrix. In other words, a e sub k equals lambda k e sub k, okay? So as t goes to infinity, if the real part of these eigenvalues is negative, then y of t will go to zero, right? Exponential of negative t goes to zero. So we have the following theorem. I haven't proved it here, I'm just stating it, but I'm giving you motivation. Theorem, if, all, if the real part of lambda k less than zero for all k, then x naught is asymptotically stable. That is to say, it decays, it decays back to equilibrium point, okay? If real lambda k greater than zero, for some k, then x naught is unstable. Okay? So, there could be, in this case, we have a saying in the US, one rotten apple spoils the bunch. Um, one rotten apple spoils the bunch. So if there's one positive eigenvalue, it's unstable. You need all the eigenvalues to have negative real parts to get stability, or asymptotic stability, okay? Now, we can't say anything if the eigenvalues have zero real part, except that that's where it's really interesting, right? Because how do you get from a negative real part to a positive real part? You have to go through a zero real part, right? And there's two kinds of zero real parts. There's zero, and there's imaginary, all right? And if you have an imaginary eigenvalue, e to the i, um, or i omega, right? Something like that. Then you guys remember this formula? e to the i omega t equals cosine omega t plus i sine omega t, right? Okay, Euler's formula, okay? so. That means that there should be some oscillations involved. And there's a great theorem, and we'll get to that, called the Hopf bifurcation theorem that tells you if I change a parameter and I have eigenvalues that go from one, I have a pair of eigenvalues. Remember, A is a real matrix, so eigenvalues have to come in complex conjugates, okay? If I have a parameter that changes, as I change the parameter, what a pair of eigenvalues goes from negative real parts to positive real parts through an imaginary eigenvalue, then we expect to see periodic behavior in the full nonlinear system. Okay? But we'll get to that in a little bit. All right? So there we go. This is called the principle of linearized stability. And it tells you that. And tell the stability of an equilibrium point, which is a really hard problem when you think about it, because this is a differential equation. You can't write the general solution down. All you have to do is write down that matrix, the linearization, and you're done. You find the eigenvalues of that. That's easy. Okay? So now I want to do this with a very simple, I'm going to start with a, I'll start with a non- I'll start with an example that's not related to biology, I mean, not related to neuroscience, just so you can kind of get a, a thought about it, okay? So I'll start with predator prey, okay? Pariah dog versus cow, okay?
or something like that. I, I, See, we use, we, we use foxes versus chickens or something in the United States. But you guys don't have foxes, or do you? Fox? Right. Well, dx dt equals x times 1 minus x minus y. And dy dt equals y times minus plus x. So this is a typical thing called a predator prey. Okay, X is as rabbits and y is foxes there are foxes and rabbits i hate rabbits okay and so anything that gets rid of rabbits is good okay so what happens is in absence of foxes then dx dt is x times one minus x and we'll, we'll explain what that does in a second in absence of rabbits dy dt is negative y so the in absence of rabbits, the foxes all die out. Okay? So let's write down the equilibrium points for this system as a warm up. What are they? Zero, zero, right? Clearly. Um, one, zero. When y is zero, that works. And when y is zero, x equals one. Okay? And then the other example, the other point is one half, one half. Okay? Everybody see that? Okay? And let's write down the, write this as x minus x squared minus xy. And this is minus y over 2 plus xy. So we'll write down that matrix of the linear equation. What's that look like? 1 minus 2x minus y minus y um, x and minus 1 half, right? That's just the. Partial derivatives of this right-hand side, df dx, df dy, dg dx, dg dy, right? And we'll look at the four, three equilibrium points. Zero, zero, we have one, zero, zero, minus one half, okay? That's diagonal matrix. So the eigenvalues are one and minus a half, stable or unstable? Hmm? Unstable, right? Positive eigenvalue, okay? So unstable. How about one zero? Well, let's look at one zero. That is um, zero, one, minus a half, and, and um, oh, did I screw this up? Oh, oh, wait. Um, oh, I forgot. This is I didn't I didn't do this right. <laughs> What's the derivative with respect to y? It's minus one half plus x. There, <laughs> there. Uh, that wasn't going to work. All right. So this is now one half, and um, y equals zero. This is minus one. Okay. There we go. Sorry. All right. Again, eigenvalue is minus one, one half. Stable or unstable? Unstable, right? So this guy's unstable. Whew. Can't just be a world where there's all rabbits. Okay? And let's do the last equilibrium. Okay? One half, one half. What do we get here? We get a zero. Huh? Right? Huh? It's one half and minus three by two. One half, one half here. Right? This is a plus one. Yeah, that's that that was my that that was an unerased line. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Otherwise, yeah. No. Um. All right. So all right, yeah. Cool now. Good. All right. Put in, yeah, I saw that there and I said, uh, that's not a minus one, and I should have erased it earlier. Um, all right, put in one half, one half. That's a minus a half, minus, so this is minus a half here. And this is um, minus a half and one half, right? Now it's a little trickier, you have to find the eigenvalues of two-dimensional matrix. So. Yet another aside, 
Let's suppose we have a two-dimensional matrix. I'll write A, B, C, D. Okay? Exercise. All right? Here's an exercise. Homework. I'm not grading them, but um, you should do them for your own benefit. All right? Recall, what is the trace of a matrix? It's the sum of the diagonals. Okay? So let trace be A plus D, and let determinant be AD minus BC. Okay? Homework. Eigenvalues of a 2 by 2 matrix have negative real parts if and only if Trace negative, determinant positive. Okay? So that's a homework problem. If you look at this, you see the trace is negative. The determinant is one-fourth is positive. So stable. Okay? So this guy is stable. In fact, we're going to use this later on, so I'm going to write down, I'm going to draw a picture. I want you to prove this too, okay? It's a really easy exercise. You know how to find the eigenvalues of a two by two matrix, right? Okay? Just take the determinant of lambda, the identity minus the matrix, and you find the roots of that. It's a quadratic. You all know the quadratic formula, okay? I'm going to draw this little picture. Is this too far over? Should I, should I reset the carriage return on the typewriter? It's okay? Okay, so here's a picture. Trace determinant, all right? And I'm gonna erase this fella. Okay, looks like this. Trace determinant, determinant negative. Two of one positive, one negative eigenvalue. Okay? One positive eigenvalue, one negative eigenvalue. Both real. Okay? This curve right here is um, okay. That's what this curve is. It's a problem. Out here, okay. Oh, I just erased two negative eigenvalues, two complex eigenvalues, negative real parts. Oh, two positive eigenvalues. Sorry. Two complex positive real part, imaginary, two complex negative real part and two negative two negative real okay so that's easy to prove okay just the quadratic formula okay so now let's apply this to a, a model I don't want to apply it to the Hodgkin Huxley because that's a four dimensional system so now what we want to do is study the so-called morris lecar equations, okay? And that's a simplified model for a membrane potential in the barnacle. Um, you guys know what a barnacle is? It's a, um, it's a mollusk that lives on the holes of ships and other rocks and things like that. It's um, also the beginning of a song called Barnacle Bill the Sailor, um, which you have to get me some of that. Um, what's the name of the, there's a famous Indian whiskey. Um, and if you put some of that in me, I'll sing it for you. <laughs> you won't find it around here. There's no place to drink in this place. Okay, anyway, so barnacle model, C dv dt plus GL V minus EL plus GK N V minus EK 
plus um, GNA M infinity of V, V minus ENA equals I. Okay? And the NDT equals N infinity of V minus N over tau N of V. Okay. This is the Morris Lacar equations. And after Kathleen Morris and Harold Lacar. And it's simplified because this is only n to 1 power. And the sodium guy is set instantly to its steady state. So this is a two dimensional system. Great, right? So now we want to analyze this, right? Oh, here's an awesome homework problem. Awesome homework problem. Ready? For any voltage-gated model, like the Hodgkin-Huxley or anything, okay? Okay? If you have this kind of state IV curve, then there'll always be one positive eigenvalue on this at this point. We'll, 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 we'll give that as a homework for the Morris Lacar. It's much easier to do that. For t okay, so there we go. Let's do our usual thing. Step one, write the steady state IV curve, right? And that's just um, I steady state of V equals GL um, V minus EL plus GK and infinity of V V minus EK plus G and A M infinity of V V minus E and A equals I. Okay? And you know it's no different than the Hodgkin Huxley. It's got um, it can have one of two forms. It can either be like that, or depending on parameters, it might look like this. Okay? Okay? So now we want to study the equilibrium points. Okay? So we have to linearize this. So, to save myself a lot of writing by doing the following equals minus 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 plus. Okay. Let's move everything over there. Okay. And now we have to write down the linearization of this, right? And so let's do that. Make the big matrix here. It's going to need a lot of room. <laughs> Okay. Two by two. All right. So let's do this one first. What's the linearization of this look like? Oh, I did that wrong. Just so we know, this is going to be V, this is N, this is V, N. So two by two. Okay. Um, I can write this as. Oh, and let me divide through by the capacitance. This is F V N, and this is G of V N. And so this matrix should be D F D V, D F D N, D G D V, D G D N. Okay? Right, two by two matrix. All right. So what is D, G, D, V? It's N infinity prime of V over tau N of V. Now, everybody, whenever I give this lecture, people always say, well, wait a second, where's the one over, you know, the tau N? 
1 over that, you take the derivative of that, it's a pain in the neck, right? It's tau n prime over minus tau n squared times n infinity of v minus n, but at equilibrium point, n is equal to n infinity of v, so that goes away. Okay? Trust me, you can do this in calculus yourself and make that substitution. Over here, it's minus, minus 1 over tau n. Oh, and just like in Hodgkin Huxley, um, m infinity of v and n infinity of v both look like that, okay? They're both monotonically increasing. They're not the same function, okay? But they, they both look like that, okay? Just like in Hodgkin Huxley, okay? Okay? So right away, what do we see? That's a negative number right here, right? Because tau n is a time constant, it's positive. So that's a negative number, right? And n infinity prime, n is increasing, so n infinity prime is a positive number, right? So right away we know this is positive, this is negative. Okay? All right, let's do the derivative of this with respect to n. It's really nice. It's just minus gk v minus ek okay. over c. Right? Everybody see that? Now, I'm going to argue that this is a negative number also. Here's why. Okay. Ek is a very big negative number, right? Minus, minus 80 or something like that, okay? V is close to rest, say minus 60. So minus 60 minus negative 80 is positive 20. Gk is a conductance that's positive, C's positive. So this is a negative number. Holy cow, look, we've got negative, negative, positive, question mark, okay? That's the hard one, and we'll do that in just a second. Suppose that this question mark was negative, okay? Suppose that this is negative. What can we conclude? We can conclude the trace is negative, the determinant's positive, right? This times this minus this times that, it's positive plus positive, okay? Then it's stable, right? So if you get a negative up here, it's stable, okay? So let's work out what this question mark guy is, okay? It's a bit of a pain, but it's not too bad. All right, we want to take the derivative of this thing with respect to v, okay? And so what is it? Derivative with respect to v minus gl, right? That's easy, over c, minus gk over c n. n's positive, right, because it's n infinity. And n goes between 0 and 1. And infinity goes between 0 and 1. Okay? It's only 0 and v goes to minus infinity. Wow. We almost have everything. Minus gna m infinity of v over c. And finally, minus GNA over C M infinity prime of V V minus ENA. Okay. Everybody agree that that's the derivative of that with respect to V. This is just freshman calculus, high school calculus. Okay. Well, that's negative. Right? That's negative. 
That's negative. Okay. What about this? Well, E at A is a whopping big positive guy. V typically lies between E, K, and E, and A. So this will be negative. M infinity prime is positive. So this guy's positive. So the question mark remains. This could be positive or negative. If it's negative, then it's asymptotically stable. How could it be positive? One way it can be positive is if m is very steep. Because right? if m is steep, if m looks like this, then m infinity, if you're around here, m infinity prime is big positive number, right? And that positive number here multiplied by this negative and this negative gives you a big positive number, can make that positive. So the case when this is so in the cases that are interesting, we have positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay? So now comes the interesting question. Is that clearly you could either have the trace positive, right? Positive minus negative, or you could have the determinant negative, right? Because this is positive times negative is negative plus positive. Could be homework, okay? Sign of the determinant equals sign of <laughs> homework. That's a good homework problem. I really urge you to try it. Okay? Oh, I'm good. I have two, two hours and 56, no, two minutes and 53 seconds. Are there going to be any donuts or anything? Huh? Cookies. Which? Cookies. Oh, cookies. I, I like donuts, but not bagels. You guys know what bagels are? are they? Somebody was telling, were you the one who was telling me you missed bagels? Somebody was telling me they missed bagels when they were um, here because you couldn't get good bagels. Um, bagels are good because they're tori. Okay. All right. So this is a really good homework, and you should try it. All right. So that means that if the steady state IV curve looks like this, the determinant's always positive, right? Because dv dt. And if the steady state curve looks like this, then any equilibrium point on this branch is always unstable because the determinant's negative, right? So in this case, where there's three equilibrium, the determinant's positive on these two, and the determinant's negative here, okay? See that? So one more second here, one minute and 44 seconds. Now, what about the trace, okay? Well, if we have this situation, and the trace is now whatever this is, so whatever this guy is, this mess, I'll call him A. It's A, trace is a minus 1 over tau n of v. Okay, right? Because there's. So now you can see if A is positive and I make the potassium really slow, what does it mean if the potassium is slow? It means tau n is big, right? Time constant big means slow, right? You guys have that intuition, okay? So if I make potassium really slow, I can force the trace to become positive, okay? So if I slow down the potassium, then I can reach, if the potassium's really fast, then the trace is always negative. 
So what have we learned? We learned that if you can make tau n of v really, really slow, then this guy could become unstable, or this guy could be unstable. And if the potassium is fast, then everything's stable on these branches, and everything's unstable on this branch. All right, well, that's a good point to stop. So I'll stop here and introduce phase plane analysis in the next, and bifurcations and stuff, all right? Let me know if I'm going too fast, all right? All right, well then eat or drink or whatever. If you have questions, come up and ask. Is that okay? Oh.